wow, this light looks interesting. <laughs> Seeing with the eyes of faith. Uh, this is not done intentionally. It's supposed to have a white glow behind the black words. Uh, but really, if you want to see this, you need to use your faith. <laughs> I'm continuing my series on help, my unbelief. And the last time I was here preaching, I was talking about advancing in faith. Where we look at the story of Gideon and how God built Gideon's faith through the Word, through supernatural encounters, through projects, and finally through supernatural affirmations. But somehow, as Gideon progressed in the building of his faith, there was always a certain measure of uncertainty. There was always like, not so sure. Moving forward, is it the right thing to do or is it a wrong thing to do? And there was this pendulum swinging back and forth. Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it right? Is it wrong? Am I really hearing correctly from God? And so I ponder more and more on this question. How can we deal with this uncertainty? So as we walk in faith, we can walk in faith with greater firmness because we have a firm foundation. So I found the answer somewhere in this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We live by faith, not faith by sight. And so this morning, I want to present to you what it means to live by faith, what it means to live by sight, what is the difference, and in between living by faith and living by sight, we discover the answer to the uncertainty in our journey of faith. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to give thanks to you. Lord, we know that you are here this morning. And Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit is keen to speak to every one of us. It is your desire to guide us into all truth. And Father, I pray that we'll understand your word so that your word may become evident in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have these two different lifestyles. Living by faith and living by sight. When Paul wrote, 2 Corinthians, he was not writing to non-believers. He was writing to believers. And so as believers, we also make, have to make a choice whether we should live by faith or we should live by sight. And without a conscious, intentional push to live by faith, we will all naturally live by sight. And that is, I believe, the reason why even though we are believers, we are not experiencing the fullness of God. We'll see more of this later on. So we're going to look at three examples to understand what live by faith and what live by sight means. In the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, it tells the story of how the Arameans came to try to attack Elisha and his servant. Israel was always under attack by the Arameans. But the Arameans was getting very frustrated because none of their advances were successful. One of them told the rest, he says that the reason is because there's a prophet in Israel, Elisha was the one, who somehow is able to hear the discussion we have in our room without him being present. And he reveals all the plans to the king of Israel and so we have never been successful. So in order to conquer Israel, we must first conquer Elisha. And so they send this army to where Elisha was. And verse 15 says, When the servant of the man of God got up, that is Elisha's servant, and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots surrounded the city. How did the servant of the man of God realize or discover that there is an army with horses and chariots? Obviously, generally, usually, it is with his eyes. He went out, he saw that there was army, there was horses and chariots. Or at least it was through his ears, either through sight or through hearing. Then he went back in, or probably if Elisha was there, he says, oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. He saw the horses and chariots, there were so many of them, and then he started to think. There's only two of us, but there's so many of them. What is going to happen? In this scenario, it is die, 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 die. There's no way we can survive this fight. 
And so he went to his master and says, what shall we do? You can sense that sense of loss. You can sense his anxiety. And then the master said, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. More with us than more with them. Me, you, two. How can two be more than them? When you use the word them, definitely more than two. And Elisha prayed, Oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. You mean all this while, the servant of the man of God was walking around with his eyes closed? I know some of us have smaller eyes. When you look at me, it looks like my eyes are closed, but I can assure you my eyes are open. This is as big as it gets. My eyes are so small that when I go through Singapore custom, they try to scan the eyes, sometimes cannot pass. And then the officer will tell me, Sir, can you please open your eyes bigger? <laughs> okay. So do you mean he had his eyes closed all this while? No. His eyes were open. That was his physical eyes. But now, when the man of God was praying for him, God was praying for his spiritual eyes or the eyes of his heart to be open, to be enlightened so that he can see into the realm of spiritual things, so that he can see things from God's perspective. And suddenly, as the Lord opened the servant's eyes, he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. These horses and chariots of fire Definitely, they are not physical, they are not natural horses and chariots. Because if chariots are on fire, what will happen to them? They will be burned to nothing. They will be totally consumed. But the fact that they continue to exist despite the fire, these are not natural, they are not physical chariots. They are chariots that come from God. So from this story, you can see that the servant of the man of God experienced two things. First, there was that physical eyes. What did his physical eyes saw? Army with horses and chariots. And then he started to put on his thinking cap. Based on his experience, we are human. There's only two of us. There's so many of them. What are we going to do? Die. That's why he asked the master, what shall we do? He was lost. He was anxious. But then, as Elisha prayed for him, his spiritual eyes opened up. He started to see things from God's perspective. He starts to have faith. And in his faith, he saw hills, of full, hills full of horses and chariots of fire. Suddenly, he became confident because he was no longer looking at it from a human, a fleshly perspective. He was looking at it from a divine perspective. His thoughts starts to change. His emotions was transformed to confidence. Another example, Mark chapter 10, verse 21 to 22. You know, the rich young ruler ran to Jesus and asked Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you know the commandments, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. He said, I've kept this since I was a young man. The Bible tells us Jesus looked at him and loved him. That tells us that everything that he claimed to do, he has done them. He was a good man. And then Jesus said, one thing you lack. If you're not satisfied with this level of life, you want to have more, then this is the way to have more. He says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. He had a question that he wanted an answer. Jesus gave him the answer. He should be happy, right? No, he was not happy. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And in this story, we can also see the difference between the physical eyes or the spirit and the spiritual eyes. The difference between walking by sight and walking by faith. Which part of this verse tells us he was walking by sight? Jesus told him, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. He heard that part. And then he went away sad because he had great wealth. He saw, I've got a lot of money. I've got a lot of property. I have a lot of assets. Now Jesus wants me to give away everything. And if I give away everything, then what do I have? I have nothing. Oh dear, I have nothing. And so he felt very sad. And that is sad. It's a loss of all his earthly treasures because he was using his sight. But in the promise of, in, 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 the, in the answer of Jesus, there was a promise. 
The promise talks about something in the future. And in order to understand and capture the essence of this promise, you need to exercise your spiritual eyes. You need to see it by faith. And so what, what's God saying? You will gain heavenly treasure. You will have treasure in heaven. And so when Jesus gave him this solution, it was truly an answer to what he was seeking. He already had earthly treasure. What he don't have is eternal treasure, heavenly treasure. And so if you're looking for what is true life, what is eternal life, Jesus' solution really works. And Jesus' solution is not for him to encounter loss, but for him to encounter gain. For him to lose what he cannot keep so that he can gain what he cannot lose. But because he was just seeing with the eyes of flesh, he was not able to understand the promise of God. Another example, John chapter 20, verse 27 to 29. Jesus had resurrected and has appeared to some of the disciples. But in all these appearances, Thomas was not around. And so the disciples told, told Thomas, Thomas, we have seen the Lord, He's resurrected. And then Thomas said, don't bluff. <laughs> Thomas said, no way. I won't believe until I see Him with my eyes, until I touch Him with my hand. And so when Jesus appeared to Thomas, He told Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my God. Thomas, check out Jesus. Touch him. Tested the wounds. Maybe see the holes where he was pierced. And then he said, Yes, this is genuine. This is really Jesus resurrected. And then Jesus commented. Jesus concluded, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so in this story, there's also these two aspects of living by faith and living by sight. Thomas is a person that lived by sight. In order to believe, he must first see. But Jesus is promoting the other lifestyle. Jesus is saying, this other way is better. And what is this other way? Those who have not seen but believe. Those who walk by faith. Even though they have not seen me, they believe that I have resurrected on the basis of what I've said. And that is even better. Some of us need to see then believe. But God wants us to grow in faith to the point where God's word is good enough. God said it, that settles it. Amen? God said it, that is as good as reality. That is as good as fact itself. But then there's a problem with faith because there's such a thing as true faith and there's such a thing as blind faith. I'm sure you have heard from people before, don't believe blindly. What does it mean in Christian context? What is true faith? What is blind faith? You see, faith must have an object. Like what Kun Leong mentioned last week, faith must have a foundation. And what is that foundation? Jesus is our firm foundation. And so faith must have an object. Faith must rest on something. It cannot anyhow say, I believe, I believe, I believe. Some of us, we believe. He say, I believe, I can do it. I can, I can, I can. And you think that if you said it loud enough, you said it fast enough, you said it many times sufficiently, regularly enough, then you can. Let's try. Huh? I believe I have $1 million in my bank. Try. I believe, I believe, I have $1 million in my bank, $1 million in my bank, $1 million in my bank. Later on, go and check and see whether you have $1 million in your bank or not. You can believe all you want. You can believe until you're excited. You can believe until your expression change. That's blind faith. So faith must have an object. What is that object? True faith is based on who God is. True faith is based on what God says. You see, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 tells us very clearly, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So where does faith come from? Faith comes from message. The message is through the word of Christ. So faith is based upon the word of Christ. And 
I can put it another way, that faith is based on who God is, why? Because the word of Christ is consistent with the person of Christ. God does not tell lies. So everything that he says is, is an expression of himself. As human beings, sometimes our word, what we say, is not what we mean. Sometimes we do not know how to express. Sometimes we intentionally tell lies. Sometimes we unintentionally tell lies. So what we say cannot be or is not necessarily a true reflection of ourselves. For example, we are so attuned in Chinese culture that whenever we meet someone, we ask the person, Jia ba wei, have you eaten? When someone asks you, have you eaten? What is your natural response? Yes, I have eaten. <laughs> People ask you whether you have eaten for lunch. You say, yes, I've eaten. But I've eaten breakfast. <laughs> we are very pious. We are very shy to tell people, no, I've not eaten. You don't believe? You try this. Next time people ask you whether you have eaten and then they tell them, not yet. And look at their expression. Because they also don't expect you to say, no, not yet. <laughs> so it is a societal norm for us to say yes. And sometimes we say yes without thinking. Without thinking, without filling our stomach, without realizing that actually we have not yet eaten. So what we say is inconsistent with the person that we are. But God is not like that. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God will not return to Him void. Everything that God says is yes and amen. And so whenever God says something, you can take me at His word because that is who He is. And so when we talk about faith resting on a certain object, we are resting on the person of God. That is who God is or what God says. But some of us, we have what is blind faith. Blind faith is based on nothing or based on our own fickle feelings and thoughts. Let me give you an example. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 26 to 46, and also in Numbers chapter 13 to 15, depending on whether you want to read the longer version of the story or the shorter version of the story, it talks about the Israelites arriving at the border of Canaan land and their eventual adventure into it. And so they got there. And Moses said, let's send out some spies to check out the land. And so they choose one person from every tribe, 12 of them, went in. After something like 40 days, they came out. And they said, wow, it was a beautiful place. A place flowing with milk and honey. The grapes are so big. One cluster of grapes needs two persons to carry. Man, I'm thinking when I go heaven, I want to try those grapes. Then, but the human beings are also big. That's where you have the stories of the giant, the sons of Anak. And so two of them says, come on, let's go. Joshua and Caleb, God is true. What God has promised is genuine. He says, it's a land flowing at milk and honey. We went and checked it out. Truly, that's what it is. Let's go. And then the other ten says, no, 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 better don't go. <laughs> if we go, <laughs> those fellas there is going to eat us for breakfast. We are just like grasshoppers in their eyes. We will not survive. We can't, we, I don't think we can even enjoy the food. They'll probably have us for food. We better don't go. And so the words of these ten people influenced the rest of the Israelites and all the Israelites went into rebellion. No, we won't go. But Moses and his brother Aaron, Joseph and Caleb, tried to persuade this entire congregation of Israelites, come on, we can do it. God is with us. Let us go. But you see, the people who are living by faith and the people who are living by sight somehow cannot coexist. And so the people who are living by sight decided to stone Moses and Aaron, Caleb and Joshua to death. At that time, the glory of God appeared and stopped them. And God pronounced judgment. The ten people who went and came out and said no, God struck them dead. And then God pronounced another judgment on them. For every day that you spend in the land of Canaan, now you're going to spend a year in the wilderness. So for 40 years in the wilderness, you will spend 40 years in the wilderness. That particular generation who came out of Egypt will not be able to enter the land of Canaan and every one of them will die in the desert. 
suddenly, they decided that, hey, we don't want to stay. We don't want to stay. When God tells them to go, they say no. When God tells them to go, that is when they need to exercise their faith and believe and go. But they say, no, no, we don't want to go. And now God says, you cannot go. They say, yes, we want to go. God says, no, they say, go. So, they went. Moses warned them, don't go, don't go, don't go out and fight. You will fall into the hands of your enemies. But they don't believe. They say, no, God is with us. We can go. And so this whole group of people went. They would not listen. And verse 34 says that they chased you. They were chased like a swarm of bees and they were beaten down all the way from Seir to Halma. So you can see that there's this difference. When God says go, they should have believed God and went. But they look at the surrounding with their eyes and make decisions based on their experience and their abilities. And they say, no way, we can do it. That was walking by sight. And then subsequently, they went from walking by sight into blind faith because God already said, don't go. But they told themselves, yes, let's go. Let's go. And it was on the basis of their own wrong belief that they went and they suffered. So what's living by faith and what is living by sight? When we live by faith, our decisions, our actions, our words and thoughts are based on who God is based on God's knowledge, based on God's wisdom, based on God's abilities, based on God's resources and what He has promised. Okay? What is living by sight? Living by sight is when our decisions, our actions, our words and thoughts are based on the information that has been collected by our five senses. And we evaluate those information on the basis of our limited knowledge, our limited wisdom, our limited experiences, and our limited resources. So basically, living by faith is reliance on God. What God says, I will do. And I know because God promised, God will back me up. Living by sight is, is relying, sorry. Living by sight is relying on self. It's based on what I can do, what I see, what I perceive, what I think, and the resources that I'm gathered. And so, the result is very different when we rely on God our experience will be unlimited. That's when we experience what is truly abundant life. Because when we rely on God, God will enable us to step beyond our comfort zone. We'll be able to experience the ways that are higher than our ways, the wisdom that is higher than our wisdom. We'll be able to experience the strength and the power that comes from God and do the things that only God can do where the impossible becomes possible. But we live by sight, then we live on, on the basis of me, who I am, what I can do, my network, my abilities. And because I am human, I am limited, so my experiences moving forward will also be limited. There will be problems that are too big for me. There'll be situations that are impossible for me to deal with. And that is when I will suffer. So, hang on to this. We're going to come back to this picture later on. Hang on to this. Now, let me ask you a question. Where do you think was the origin of living by sight? Where did it start? Where did it start? Adam and Eve. Yes, Adam and Eve. You remember the story? Just, just go back, go back. Adam and Eve will be in Genesis. So it starts with Genesis chapter 1. What happened in Genesis chapter 1? God created heavens and the earth. And then verse 31 says, God says, everything was very good. Then you go into chapter 2. That is when God made Eve, God gave uh, Adam the instruction of taking care of the Garden of Eden, the fruit of the knowledge of tree of good and evil. You must not eat the fruit of the tree of life. You can eat. You must tall the ground, blah, 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 blah. And then God made him a wife, a woman, someone that come out from his own flesh. And then uh, Adam was so excited. Adam opened his eyes and saw Eve and he said, Wow, man! Because there was no other man. So this is the only man or human being other than himself. Wow, man. Then become woman. 
Okay, anyway. <laughs> chapter 3. Chapter 3 was where the temptation was. And what was the temptation? Remember? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You mean all this while in chapter 1 and chapter 2, when Adam saw Eve, he had his eyes closed? No. So this eyes is not really referring to a physical eyes, but it's talking about a certain lifestyle. And the following phrase enlightened us, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Today we have huge investment in the pursuit of, pursuit of knowledge. We want to know more. Is there anything wrong in wanting to know more? The Bible also says, for a lack of knowledge, my people perish. So God is not against knowledge. But what is this verse really trying to say? It is trying to say that when you eat of the fruit, you will use your eyes, you will use your natural abilities, you will use your own knowledge, you will go into a lifestyle of self-governance. You will decide apart from God. And that is why it is wrong. Prior to chapter 3, Adam and Eve was living under the guidance of God. God is the determinant of what is right and wrong. God says it, that settles it, I will obey. But now it's different. What God says is God's problem. Let me think. Let me decide whether it is right or wrong. Just like what the Israelites did. Just like what the book of Judges did. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They become the final arbitrator of what is right and what is wrong. What is the decision to be made? It's self-governance. And so when you think about walking by sight, it's not so simple as walking in a natural realm. We are walking in a system that was initiated, possibly patented, marketed by the devil itself. And so, brothers and sisters, we really have to choose between living by faith and living by sight. Even after we have become believers, because this verse was written to believers, it is easy for us to always fall back to living by sight because that is the way we have been living from the time we were brought into this earth. So how do you live your life? Do you live your life based on... Uh, Influenced by, by, by who God is? Or do you live your life influenced by your own perception of things based on, on your, your own abilities and resources? If you rely on God, your experience with God will be unlimited and it will be abundance. But if you rely on yourself, it will be limited. So remember, we were trying to answer this question of uncertainty in our journey of faith. Why is it uncertain? It is because we often vacillate or we often swing between living by faith and living by sight. For example, remember the story of how Peter was in a boat and there was a storm and he saw Jesus coming. And Peter says, Lord, if it is you, let me come. Walk to you on the waters. And so Jesus said, come. So when Peter heard the word of Jesus, say, come, he responded in faith. He didn't quickly put on his thinking cap and say, huh, walk on water, can man, look at all the waves, not possible. Okay, so, but he didn't do that. He just latched on to what Jesus said. He stepped up from the boat and he started walking on water. That is walking by faith. But suddenly, he got distracted. He looked at the waves around him that is walking by sight. Then he started to sink. And so we are always in this condition because whenever God asks us to live by faith, He's often asking us to step out from our comfort zone, to attempt something we have not attempted before, to raise our spiritual life to a higher level, to a different realm, a realm that we are not used to, the realm that we are not familiar with, that unknown realm. And so when God tells us, when we fix our eyes on what Jesus said, we have the faith. We have the confidence and then we'll say, let's go. Then sometimes we are distracted and look at the circumstances and say, huh, fight with the giants? No way. Walk on water, look at the waves? No way. 
the horses and chariots of the Arameans? No way. And so every time we look this side, we look at us, we use the living by sight, we say, no way, no way, no way, no way, no way, no way. And then we turn around, look at God, yes, 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 yes. Then we turn around, look at the problems, no, 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 no. So the whole life is forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward. Hopefully, you go forward a little bit more, then you go backward, at least you inch forward. And so the way to stop this uncertainty as we journey by faith, the way to stop this anxiety is to keep focus on what Jesus has said. To receive revelation after revelation from God. To let God speak to you and continue to build your faith. Every time you feel slightly uncertain, every time you feel the anxiety, don't let the anxiety bring you all the way to the bottom before you go out. The moment you sense that this comforting feeling, quickly turn back to God. Say, God, what do I have to do? God, how do I proceed? Where do I go from here? Amen? And so how does faith help us? Why is it so important? Faith helps us to experience breakthroughs in our difficulties, such as Elisha's servant and the Arameans. He was lost and was able to see things in faith and saw the horses and chariots of fire. He became confident. Like Jairus and his dead daughter, Jairus' daughter was sick. He went to Jesus and said, Jesus, please come with me, pray for my daughter. Along the way, his servants came, don't trouble the master anymore because your daughter is dead. And Jesus said, your daughter is not dead. Got to Jairus' home, the people said, your daughter is dead. And Jesus said, your daughter is not dead, she's asleep. The people that were there at the funeral laughed at Jesus. When you walk by sight, it is impossible. When you walk by faith, it is possible. And God raised the daughter. Jesus raised the daughter from the dead. Then you have also Israelites and the sons of Anak. When they saw the sons of Anak, it was impossible because they were walking by sight. If only they had believed. Which subsequent generation of Israelites went in, they believed. Caleb, remember, he says, Give me this mountain the mountain that was a stumbling block to the conquering of Canaan. Caleb said, give it to me. And they conquered the mountain. They were truly able to overcome, even though they were just like grasshoppers in the eyes of the giants. So 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. If you want to overcome the world, you need faith. You need faith to live a victorious Christian life. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 24 tells us that, I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Look at the power of faith because faith is vested in God. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received and it will be yours. When you believe God, you realize that God is bigger than your problems. Amen. About two weeks ago, I was preaching in a church in Singapore. And then after the church, of, church service was over, there was a couple that came up to me. And then suddenly the wife says, pray for us. And the husband looked at her and it's like, because the husband is quite a new believer, not sure what to, how to respond in this kind of situation. So the husband looked at the wife. And then the wife very quickly says, she started off with saying, pray for us. And then she went on to say, pray for my husband. <laughs> Women are very wise. <laughs> they know how to kill along the men. <laughs> pray for us. Pray for my husband. He said, my husband has this problem. He's been suffering this pain for four months. In the gym, somehow he strained his back muscle. So he went to the chiropractor. Didn't improve much. He went to the TCF didn't improve much. He went to physiotherapist, also didn't improve much. It was so painful for him. It was difficult for him to get in and get out of bed. It was difficult for him to sit down and also to stand up. And so I, I took the opportunity to share with him how God healed me of my own backache. And then he said this. He said, wow, amazing. Oh, something like that can happen. He said, I can feel my hair standing. 
So I said, okay, okay, let's pray for you. So I prayed for him. After praying for him, a simple prayer, I asked him, I said, can you tell me whether there's any difference before and after prayer? He looked like someone who's like, nothing happened. But so I asked him, I said, on a scale of 1 to 10, where was your pain level before prayer? And on a scale of 1 to 10, where is your pain level after prayer? And so he started to try. Forward, backward, side, side, forward, backwards, side, side. Either one or the other, he says that now when I move forward, there's no more pain. But when I move backward, before prayer, it was a seven, now it is a four. I said, oh, good, got improvement. Then he tried. Say, let's pray one more time. So I prayed for him another time, and then he tried. Uh, still, oh, no more pain. He was going to say, still got a bit, I think. And then he said, forward, backward, forward, backward, side, side. No more pain. And then he says, no more pain. Then he said, really? Oh, no more pain. Oh. And then the wife was talking to somebody else. He said, OMG, oh my God. Yeah, that's the good place to use, oh my God. <laughs> because it's really my God. <laughs> then, then, he, then, then he tried and tested. It's like, it took him about two to three minutes to settle down. Really? No more pain. And then the wife came over. He says, you know, this thing happened, no more pain. And the wife said, really? He said, really? Do I say, really? He said, really? They really for a long time. <laughs> but the pain was really gone. Amen. God can do amazing and wonderful things because God is able and God is bigger than our challenges, our problems. The next thing is that God's faith or the faith in God will enable us to be resilient, to persevere through our difficulties. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, to see the invisible that is faith. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Where does this concept of eternity come from? It comes from God. It is based on God's promises. And so this verse is trying to tell us we need to operate in faith. We need to see life from the perspective of heaven. And when we begin to see life from the perspective of heaven, the perspective of eternity, we will realize that our life on earth is so short compared to what we have in heaven. And so all our troubles, all our challenges, no matter how painful, how difficult it is, it is momentary. It is only a short time. And what is very interesting is chapter 4 verse 16 to 18 comes after chapter 4 verse 7 to 10. And this passage from 7 to 10 has been used as a lyric of a song. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. For we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despair, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Yes, we may go through difficulties and challenges, but when we capture that glimpse from heaven, then all our sufferings, all our difficulties is almost equal to nothing and it's easy for us to go through. And that's why Jesus said, for the joy, future, eternity, set before him, he was able to go through the pain of the cross. Just the other day, I was in a conversation with a pastor from Penang. He is 60 plus. And then he was telling me the story of his conversion some 50 years earlier, just after his SPM. He got home. He went to a Christian meeting. And it was in the Christian meeting, he was so touched and he decided to believe in Jesus. He went back. Somehow, the father and the mother found out. Don't know how they found out, but they did. And the father was waiting for him with a spear in his hand. The spear was kept in the house because on the previous year, the house has a 
break in. And so the father kept the spear in order to deal with whoever that was going to break in the house. And that night or that evening, he was going to use it towards the sun. He put the spear straight into his face, pointed the spear straight into his face and asked him, renounce Jesus. You will not believe in Jesus. But he says, Jesus is so good, I cannot, don't believe in Jesus. The father was threatening to spear him and the mother quickly stand between him and the son, the father and the son. And the mother quickly pushed the son up to the second floor and went into the furthest room and locked the room and told the son, you stay inside, you don't come out. And then the mother said to the father, if you want to kill your son, you have to kill me first over my dead body. The son was inside, overheard this argument and conversation between the father and mother and he cried and he cried and he cried. The word got out to his friends and the friends was thinking, how can we rescue him? prepare like a halfway house, prepare a place where he can stay so that he continue believing in Jesus. But he prayed about that. And then he says that, no, God wants me to stay in the house. That is faith. Walk by sight, there's so much danger. But he believed that God would protect him. And so he continued to stay in the house. He continued going to the church, continued to face persecution, insults, discouragement, he, was, he remained strong. And then two years later, you know what happened? The mother came to him and said that your father said, you know the father, very, you know, like a Chinese father, a lot of pride, cannot go to the son and tell the son what he wants to say. Told the mother to tell the son. And so the mother went to the son and said this to the son, you don't stop going to church. You don't stop going to the church. Why? Because the father and mother saw such wonderful transformation in the son because of what Jesus has done. Amazing. And later, both the father and mother believed in Jesus. And so even when we are going through difficulty, maybe God does not remove that difficulty, but God will give us faith to be strong and transform us from the inside out so that we can cope with that difficulty. So brothers and sisters, very quickly, give me two minutes. How can we live by faith? I've already mentioned it in the first message and the second message. This is the third part. Romans chapter 10 verse 17, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. There are times when I get into difficulties and challenges and I'm not sure what to do. When you're not sure what to do, what do you do during those times? You start to think aloud. You start to talk to yourself. I talk to myself. So I talk to me and we have this conversation. You know, like that, like that, like that. Do you think I should do? No, la, you don't do this. La. You do this, la. you'll be like that, like that, like that. Oh, then I don't like that, like that, then like this, like this, like that, like that, like this. Still cannot answer the question, right? Because I is limited. Me is also limited. So limited and limited is called limited company. <laughs> There's li limitations. There's no answer. So what I do is that I practice this three-person. Sorry. I practice this three-person conversation. So I and me cannot come to a conclusion. At that time, I will invite Jesus. God, what do you think? And suddenly, God is involved in our discussion. And we try to listen and try to sense what God is saying. And amazingly, very often, in that three-person conversation, there is light, there is answer, there is solution. That's how the Word of God comes in. That's how faith comes in. And that's when faith comes in, anxiety, uncertainty will go out. Amen? So I want to encourage you, live by faith, not by sight. Live according to God's way, don't live according to Satan's way. Use God's method. Don't use the method marketed by the evil one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give thanks to you. God, you are so good. Lord, we thank you that through faith, we can experience all that is in you, all that you possess. We can experience who you are and what you have. And Lord, it is your desire that we encounter you more and more. 
Because you are the one who says you have come, that we have life and life more abundantly. Lord, you do not want us to live with limitations, but you want to, us to experience the life of abundance, a life without limitations. God, we just thank you because you are good and so kind to us. And so God, I pray that you impress upon our hearts to live by faith. Yes, it is true, we have been living by sight. And this change of paradigm from living by sight to living by faith may be difficult, may not be normal. We may not be accustomed to it, accustomed to it. But Father, we pray that you help us to know that there is a better way in all our circumstances, all our situations, our decisions, our thoughts, the words we speak, our actions must be based on our faith in you. Help us, God, so that we can truly experience all that you have and all that you have promised to us. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters. We want to pray for your blessing upon each and every one of them. As they leave and depart from this place, Lord, we pray for your presence to go with them, to speak to them and enable them to hear you because your sheep, your word says, your sheep will hear your voice. At the entrance of your voice, at the entrance of your word, you will bring light and you will bring faith so that we can all live by faith. Lord, we want to pray especially for those who are not well physically. In Jesus' name, let your healing power now flow to all those areas that is not functioning well, to the, all those areas that are in pain, to all those, all those organs that has been affected, that has been infected, in Jesus' name, we pray for healing to come upon all our brothers and sisters. Thank you, Jesus, because your faith, faith in you, will lead us to breakthroughs in our difficulties. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.